Difficult to beat a team three times in a season? Apparently not. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Thursday, March 14th, 2024. Welcome into this live postcast edition of the Locked on Tar Heels podcast. Coming to you a little bit later than normal after the game had some things to attend to, but so glad you're here on the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you are joining us at the place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. Thanks so much for making us your listen after the game, special shout out to all you everydayers out there and all of you from our Discord channel. By the way, if you're not part of the Locked on Tar Heels bracket challenge for March Madness, you're going to want to make sure to do that. Uh, the link for that is in the show notes. Come check it out. All right, here we go. North Carolina knocks off Florida State 92 to 67 in the first game of the ACC tournament on Thursday. You worry about those noon tips? Nah. Carolina was locked in and ready to go. They run their record now to 26 and 6 on the season. So here's what we do on these live postcast shows. I'm going to give you four things I was uh just takeaways, quick takeaways. Uh, we'll have an ad read, we'll do four more, and then we'll stop and look at some questions and observations and comments you all have in the chat. And then we'll have more big picture takeaways on on tomorrow's full show on the Friday show. So make sure you tune in for that, as well as getting ready for whoever it is that Carolina will play in the semifinals on Friday night, which right now as we record, looks like it'll be Pitt, uh, who was up 46 to 35 on Wake Forest. Quite frankly, that's who I would rather play. Wake Forest scares me more than does uh, Pitt. But you know what? I would have rather faced Virginia Tech than FSU. And well, we all saw what happened. Okay. So here we go. Number one thing I want to talk about as we're rolling today. Absolutely no hangover for the Tar Heels following the win over Duke because what an emotional win that was yet again. And we all remember what happened after the initial victory over the Blue Devils. Carolina went out that next Tuesday and lost it home to Clemson. The only home loss the Tar Heels had all season just the second ever loss to Clemson at home. Not this time. The Tar Heels had longer of a, a, a layoff. There's the postseason. They know what they're doing. And Carolina came out and dominated this game essentially from start to finish. I know the first couple minutes there, there were some turnover problems and things like that. But then Carolina was ready to go. Now. Think about this opponent as we think about not only was there not a hangover, but Carolina, yes, had beaten Florida State both times they played this season, but both were struggles. The first game, obviously, there was the big comeback where Carolina was down 14 early in the second half. In the second game, Florida State took a halftime lead and, and Carolina had to come back and, and pull out in the second half. But this was a domination against a good Seminole team. And you know what I'm always talking about, right? I want Carolina to get a lead. I want them to extend a lead and I want them to maintain that lead. That's exactly what Carolina did. After a pretty close game for the first couple minutes, Carolina in the first half just started methodically extending this lead. Got it to, I think it was 19 right before Florida State got just that great skip pass to the corner for a three right at the halftime buzzer to cut it to 16. Um, and then to start the second half, I think Florida State got the first bucket, cut into it a little bit. I think they got it down to as little as 12. And then Carolina just pushed it right back on out, got it to 20. And once it was 20, I haven't gone back through the play-by-play -play yet, but once the lead was 20, it never dipped back below 20 again. Anytime Florida State had some modicum of a push, Carolina answered right back. Like they had one three in the second half, Florida State did. Carolina answered it right back in the form of Cormac Ryan, if I remember correctly who it was. The Tar Heels just answered anything and everything that Florida State had for them. I love it. There was no noon, uh, you know, slow start. There was no, uh, you know, Coach Rob and I talked about on Thursday's show how Florida State had a little bit of an advantage because they had already played the day before and because they're deep. 
no, that was not to be. You love to see it. Now, as we continue on into this thing, what I want to do is go ahead and bring up the box score for us. For those of you watching, you can obviously see that. And then um, for those of you who are listening back, you can pull up the box score wherever you're at doing what you do. Because the next thing I want to get to as I zoomed way in on my show notes and can't read them anymore is Carolina's ability to do what we just talked about, getting that big lead is so critical, not only to shut down a potentially athletic and, and opponent that you've seen be able to get back into games against Carolina this year, but it allowed for a lot of bench minutes to be played, a lot of bench um, help in terms of scoring and other things. The bench chipped in in big ways, and that's so key. When you're hoping to play three games in three days, you can't just be relying on an iron five sort of approach, and thankfully, Carolina didn't have to. For example, Paxson Wojcik, who will sometimes get some spot minutes in the first half, was able to come in with 10 and a half minutes left in the second half. You don't see that normally if Carolina's in a bit of a struggle. That's incredible. One of the things I'm always looking at in a game like this where, where you're trying to play multiple games in multiple days, how many minutes are the starters having to play? You want to guess if, if you haven't already looked at it? No Tar Heel played more than 30 minutes. RJ played 30 minutes. The other four starters, 28, 26, 26, 28. That's it. That's exactly what I want to see, knowing that Carolina is going to have to play again tomorrow and hopefully again on Saturday. And that's the good thing. Like, if you can get through that noon tip, you got a long time because Carolina tipped at noon and they will have the earlier tip on Friday, but it, it, that won't be until seven o'clock. And so, great stuff there. All five starters sat the final four minutes of the game. RJ and Armando had checked out well in advance of that. Like uh, before that, Elliot Cadeau was the only starter still in. The bench contributed in this game 29 of Carolina's 92 points. That's 31.5% of the scoring. That's what you love to see out of your bench. This is needed. They were active and engaged and contributing in big ways, not just Seth Trimble, who was the best guy off the bench. And let's talk uh, about the three typical bench contributors, meaning Seth and the Jalen's, Jalen Washington, Jalen Weathers. All three of those guys played double digit minutes in this game, 18 for Seth, 14 for Jalen Weathers, 11 for Jalen Washington, and then Paxson Wojcik himself had nine minutes. So that's incredible. Let's talk about Seth, though, because he was the key um, contributor for the Tar Heels off the bench. Seth Trimble uh, played 18 minutes, as I said, 12 points, four of seven from the field, four of four at the free throw line, Seth was. I think even one of those was on a one and one situation, five rebounds, two assists. He did have two turnovers, but um, man, just doing work. But Whew, how have we gotten this far and not yet talked about his dunk? You know, Seth Trimble has had those moments this year where he's had to go back and look at how he finishes his decision making uh, when he's going to the rim, already knowing what he wants to do. And when he took off, oh boy, you knew he was coming down with that one. What an absolute play from Seth. Um, from Jalen Withers, six points, seven rebounds for him contributing to all that. You love to see it. All right, third thing we want to talk about. Elliot Cadeau. Let me say this very plainly, very clearly. This version of Elliot Cadeau can take North Carolina to the national championship. I mean that firmly. Eight points, four rebounds, six assists, two turnovers, a block, and three steals in just 28 minutes, plus 22 while he was on the floor. Now, he actually would have had more assists than that. There was a couple, there were a couple that were kind of bungled or, or not handled well because his stat line does not tell the whole story of how devastating he was in this game. I loved coach uh, on, on Thursday's show, coach Rob and I asked the question, whose turn is it to go off? And, and truthfully, what I love is that it was kind of everyone's turn to go off. What a balanced win this was for the Tar Heels, but coach Rob said, Elliot Cadeau. And while he did not get to double figures like four of his teammates did, Elliot, to me, was the dominant player in this game. He was doing everything, but chiefly the thing that impressed me the most is his willingness and ability to set the tone in toughness. There was that, that ball 
um, that was over in front of the Carolina bench that he had no business getting to, but he was the first one there, bloodied up his knees, had another one when he was on the ground. I, I just love it. Um, Elliot, you know, I've been on him a lot this year to finish with his left hand. When he gets to the left side of the rim, he had three left-handed finishes in this game. I was so incredibly proud of Elliot for just continuing to grow with that left hand. That might be one of my favorite points of his progression this year. There, there was an interesting lineup combination where it was uh, Seth and both Jalen's along with Elliot and I believe it was Harrison Ingram. That was an interesting lineup. And in that moment, in that kind of set was when he had that first left-handed finish and then back-to-back -back looks to Jalen Withers and Jalen Washington. That, that was the missed dunk for Jay Witt, but then Jalen Washington had a nice finish. And then a possession or two later had another great look to Jalen Withers who did, uh, he was fouled and made one of two. But let me just give you a sequence that to me shows the greatness of what Elliot Cadeau is doing right now. 7.45 left in the first half. Um, he comes up the court. For some reason, his defender and Armando's defender were on the high side of Armando. Mondo, much to his credit, saw it and just slipped. Beautiful touch from Elliot out over the top of that for two points. On Florida State's ensuing possession, and this truthfully is credit to Cormac Ryan for kind of showing out, but um, Elliot gets a steal, goes the other way, and this was that amazing, unreal finish over Primo Spears where he goes up kind of with his left hand. Primo brings his hand down to block it. Elliot has enough hang time to bring it bound back to the right side, spin it in, and go tumbling off. This, this is the, one of the things I'm impressed with the most about Elliot Cadeau is his ability to finish at the rim. I mean, it's almost uncanny how good he is at doing it. I, his ability to adjust midair on that one befuddled me. Um, he had another steal where Mondo had just been stripped of the ball. Five, five and a half minutes left in the first half. Baba Miller goes, Oop -a -doop -a -doop, trying to go up the floor. Elliot just rips it from him and just takes it like it was like it was his ball the whole time. And then like two plays later was when he had that one I was talking about um, when, when he got that steal on in front of Carolina's bench, just um, uh, Jameer Watkins who had had a game on Wednesday against Virginia tech did a great job staying in front of him, draw his fourth, drew his fourth foul uh, like on an offensive foul, 11 minutes and 43 seconds left in the game. Just so good from Elliot Cadeau. All right. Number four in this game, perhaps, in the most statistically bewildering thing that has happened all season. You probably know what I'm about to say. Carolina's ability to rebound the basketball in this game was insane. The finishing numbers, North Carolina, 48 total rebounds to 22 for Florida State. Carolina had 17 offensive boards, 31 defensive boards. Florida State had just seven offensive and 15 defensive. That's right. Let me just unpack this some more. Carolina had more offensive rebounds than Florida State had defensive rebounds. At halftime, Carolina led the Seminoles in rebounding 22 to 6. At that moment, Armando Baycott had more rebounds than did the Seminoles by himself. In fact, at one point in the second half, both Armando and Harrison Ingram, each individually, like the leading rebounders in the game, Armando Baycott, Harrison Ingram, Florida State. It went in that order. Carolina got it up in the second half to 30 to 8 in total rebounds. Florida State didn't get their 10th rebound, didn't get to double digit rebounds until there was nine minutes and 28 seconds left in the game. That means we had already seen 30 minutes and 32 seconds of game action before the Seminoles got their 10th rebound of this basketball game. I am befuddled. I know you are too. Carolina, once again, has not been out rebounded since the Oklahoma game back in mid December. Keep it going, Tar Heels. All right. So there's the first four things we want to talk about. We got four more, and then I want to get to your questions and comments and thoughts. Go ahead and be dumping those in uh, to the comment section, and we'll get to those in a little bit. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is Carolina's defense. We talked about the rebounding, but boy, was the defense yet again a big time story for Carolina. And that's where we're going to go next. Right after I tell you, this episode is brought to you by our good friends at FanDuel. 
Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the NCAA tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. After a performance like we saw today, I'm going with the Tar Heels. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until somebody cuts down the nets. Somebody. We know who that's going to be, right, gang? Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're unpacking North Carolina's dominant 92-67 to victory over Florida State in their first game in the quarterfinals of the ACC tournament. Got four more things we want to look at, and then we'll go to questions and comments uh, that you have for us. Next thing I want to talk about is North Carolina's defense. I, I, I just can't quit saying it this year. Sure, the offense for Carolina was great in this game. Carolina's points per possession was 1.353. That is an insane number. Like 1.4 is like, like record-breaking elite type offensive production. So Carolina did their absolute work here. Carolina in this game held Florida State to 0.944 points per possession. They they have gotten back that defense that they had in their 10 game winning streak. They've had it multiple times lately and that's what we're looking for and talking about. Florida State just like you, you look back to the things they were able to do on Wednesday against Virginia Tech. There was absolutely none of that because Carolina is so connected defensively. They trust each other. They're willing to fight for each other, to fill in gaps, to play help defense. I, I mean, just even in Jameer Watkins, who's been having a season for Florida State offensively, had 30 points against Virginia Tech, just 12 in this game, 12 points six of which came from the free throw line. He was 0 of 3 from 3, 3 of 11 from the field. Critical, critical job by Seth Trimble. We talked about his offense. We can't ever forget what a great job Seth does defensively. This Carolina team is pesky. They are annoying in the best way possible. One, of, The big thing I want to talk about on the full Friday show as we get going is some comments from Jay Billis that I thought were so critical. I don't want to talk about it right now because I want to save it for tomorrow's show, but Carolina is on one defensively, and there's no reason to think that they can't be this locked in for eight more games, two more in the ACC tournament and six in the NCAA tournament. They caused, Carolina did, two shot clock violations in the first half. I loved one of them was just like in a scrum where nobody could get the ball and the shot clock ran out as that was happening. Cormac Ryan staying in front of Baba Miller to draw his third foul early in the second half on an offensive foul. We already talked about Elliott drawing Jameer Watkins' fourth foul just continuing to cripple his ability to do much in this game. Not even close to replicating that performance. You know, Carolina, we've been looking at their ability to hold teams under 70 points this season. They do it yet again in this one. Florida State, uh, yeah, they got to 67, but some of that was just the sloppiness of the final four minutes where Carolina is just rotating in bench guys and, and, and doing all those kind of things. Florida State didn't get, didn't crack 60, until there were under three minutes to go in this game. Absolutely great stuff from Carolina. You love to see the Tar Heels now on a seven-game winning streak, once again on the backs of their defense, which is still rated fifth right now at Ken Palm. So that's phenomenal. Number six, Armando Baycott. I love it when I'm wrong, and I can own it and claim it. It's honestly one of my favorite things. I don't know why. I just think it's kind of hilarious. I was deadly wrong about Armando's role in this game. One of the things, if, if you listen to Thursday's show with Coach Rob and I, I said, I don't think this is a, an Armando Baycott game because of Florida State's length and athleticism and ability to bother Armando inside. Well, our guy, 14 points of five of eight shooting, four of four from the free throw line, a double double, 10 point or 10 rebounds, excuse me, six of which were on the offensive glass. Uh, he and he and Harrison combined for 11 offensive rebounds. Just absolutely ridiculous stuff this year. Armando only had to play 26 minutes. What I love about him is he's going to do whatever Carolina needs for him this season in any given game. And I was just so proud of him. Let me give you two specific reasons why. Armando, there was a moment in the first half where he was blocked. 
at the rim. Florida, it was a great block. Florida State gets the ball, gets a kind of a run out. They settle for a three. They miss because they only made four of them on the day. Heels go right back the other way. Armando doesn't really need to sprint down the court because it's not a full-on transition, but he's going right down the middle of the lane. Our, uh, Jalen Withers got the outlet to RJ. Jalen Withers gets out ahead of Armando even, but then RJ finds Armando cutting down the middle of the floor. He's able to switch to his left hand, go up, and score. What I loved about it, and this is the first thing I was so proud of by Armando, is that he didn't hang his head or sulk after getting blocked. He sprinted back the other way and sprinted back again. RJ finds him. He gets a bucket. Good job, Armando. Now, another thing, something I've been trying, I don't think I've talked about it much, but if my memory serves me correct, Armando has missed a gimme dunk in three straight games. That would be what? What, what are the last three? Virginia, Notre Dame, and Duke. Is that right? Virginia? No, NC State, Notre Dame, and Duke. Armando on this one. Attack, do you like the Carolina's 13th point? Armando gets a pass out on it's kind of sort of the wing, it's to the baseline side of the wing, right in front of uh, Florida State's bench. Spins, attacks the rim, and it is a dominant dunk through traffic over and above everyone. I loved it, it was vicious. And then Armando had two other dunks in this game, making up for those three misses. But then he does all these little things too, for example. He had a great tap out just above three minutes left in the first half um, that went to Harrison Ingram. Harrison had just missed the three, the one that Armando rebounded. Harrison sees that Cormac Ryan is even more wide open and is the better shooter. So Harrison swings it to him for a three. That was the first of Carolina to kick out threes on offensive rebounding action. You just love to see it. Way to go, Armando. Now, speaking of three-point shooting, that's the seventh thing I want to talk about. We, we had discussed on today's show, one of the things that Carolina needed to do was hold down Florida State's three-point shooting because the Seminoles had had anomaly three-point shooting against Carolina this year where Florida State averages like six per game. They had made nine and 12 against Carolina. That was uh, two of their six best three-point outings of the season. Today, nah. Four of 16 from the three-point line, just 25%. Some regression to the mean there. Now, to be fair, the three that they hit in the first half were wide open, kind of some missed defensive things. Although the one right before halftime, I will say, was just a great skip pass from side to side, and Seth couldn't recover all the way out. It's fine. You can live with that right before halftime, especially when you've already got a 19-point lead. And then just one in the second half. Great job by Carolina from running Florida State off and, and Florida State just doing more of what they normally do. The eighth and final thing I want to mention before we go to your questions is two stat areas that Carolina dominated in a big way that, that you often wonder if they'll be able to do against, again, a long and athletic Florida State team. Carolina led the points in the paint in this game, literally almost doubling up Florida State. It was 46 to 24 by Carolina. Now, that's keep in mind, points in the paint is not just about entry passes and Armando Baycott or Jalen Washington finishing inside. This is Elliott getting to the rim. This is RJ getting to the rim. This is North Carolina not settling and attacking. This has been a staple that we've seen from the Tar Heels quite a bit lately. Elliott can go so much more aggressive. Cormac Ryan has been attacking at will lately. And I've been so impressed by it because Cormac, you know, was three of four from three, but also was, was what then two of three on twos. Cause he's getting in and he's making shots. Not only that, but Carolina won this game at their pace. Carolina won the fast break points 26 to six. You think about Florida state's depth and athleticism. They want to get out and move too. But man, I thought this game was played at Carolina's pace and the Tar Heels win that part of the battle 26 to six an all around dominant win from the North Carolina Tar Heels on Thursday. Boy, you love to see it. Okay, now we're going to go to your comments, questions, observations, see what we want to pull up. I'm going to leave uh, the box score up for those who are watching so that you can see it as well. Quick check in, by the way, in real time, Pitt is still up eight on Wake Forest, 57 to 49 with 817 to go in the game. All right, first thing, Michael Shadron says, Isaac, I need an update on RJ's three-pointers made this season. Well, RJ made two in this game. He was uh, two of, um, 
how many I pulled the box score away, but let me give you an update on how many he's made. He came into this game. What did I say? 97. That's right. So now he has 99, uh, Pat Kilby and I had guessed the over on 3.1. He was just shy of that. Uh, RJ was two of five from three, by the way. So he is now up to 99, one three pointer away from becoming just the second ever Tar Heel to get to triple digits. Who was the other? Everybody say it with me. Justin Jackson, what season? 2016 and 17, a national championship season. What was Justin Jackson that year? The ACC player of the year. By the way, speaking of that, they said on the on the uh, broadcast early that Carolina had just had five previous ACC players of the year, and Justin Jackson wasn't listed on that. Am I crazy or did I, did I see that? Justin Jackson was the ACC player of the year in 2016-17. Uh, come on. DSPN, get that one right. <laughs> you love to see it. Um, Derek Thiessen, what's up, Derek? Great to hear from you and see you as always. Um, you know, I, I had said earlier, who was the one going to go off in this game? And Derek says, don't get me wrong. I love it when a player goes off. Absolutely, Derek, I'm right with you. But he says, that being said, seeing a balanced scoring like that is so great to see. And Derek, you're absolutely right. Why? because that is impossible for a defense to guard. How on earth, like if, if you're able to say, all right, guys, here's the deal. RJ Davis is going to score 30 points. Let him, that's fine. Cause nobody else is going to beat you. But if you're coach Leonard Hamilton in the locker room and you're saying, all right, guys, here's the deal. Four Tar Heels are going to score in doubled figures today. Two more are going to score eight and nine points. And another is going to score six, meaning Seven different Tar Heels scored six or more points in this game. You cannot defend that. This is the hallmark of a team where anyone could go off. How many times have we been having to say it? You could go off at any moment and anyone can do it. And in a game like this, like Carolina scored 92 points and nobody got to 20. That is very, very impressive. <laughs> so uh we keep rolling like that uh murray jules i'm gonna pull this one up says our point guard is playing like a true point guard attack attack he takes no unnecessary three-pointers because just because he is open number seven trimble keep playing defense and keep on attacking to the basket tar heel for life Murray is, is, is spot on. Look, Elliot did take four threes in this game, but they were all within the rhythm of the offense. He didn't make any of them, but I thought he needed to take those and keep Florida state honest. Elliot is doing everything you need. He is attacking at a tie loss in level. His burst in speed is otherworldly good. His ability to get by seasoned to veterans like he did against Jeremy Roach on Saturday is, is, uncanny six assists two turnovers against a pesky and ball hawking florida state defense elliot cadeau is not playing like a freshman or a high school senior i should say even better you love to see it but man seth trimble he his confidence is through the roof right now as, as murray's saying his um like getting to the rim that dunk but his his commitment to just pulling up in mid-range and not you know it's like huh I, I can do all of that and bottle a guy up on defense. I know he was third in the ACC six man of the year voting. That's not the third best six man of the year. Seth Trimble is an absolute dude. Emily Van Pocky. What's up? Emily says Zayden high was impressive today. I was so proud of Zayden getting in. I uh, just had a couple minutes there at the end. Had a nice reverse layup right after Jalen Withers got hung. Did y'all see that? It was a great attempt. Uh, but Zayden had a nice reverse finish after that. And then he had a great move in the lane just a possession or two later. And then how about Seth to uh, a Conquo for that alley-oop? Great stuff from the bench, man. Just, just so many things there. All right, let, let's keep scrolling through, see if we want to get another uh, question or two before we move on uh, with the rest of our day um oh matthew this is a, a good follow-up matthew trexler says uh bill has corrected the mistake on air after the next commercial break but they didn't show the accurate list that's in terms of acc players of the year so thank you for that matthew trexler um good to know i i missed him saying that so i'm good to know that that they didn't get that um so good stuff there um Woof. Okay. I think that's it that that we want to uh, attack on uh the comments and questions y'all how can you watch this game and not be overwhelmingly encouraged by what you saw 
I mean, it's it's absolutely insane. Um, no reason C- Carolina can't keep rocking and rolling and doing what they did again today. Although, you know, you know me, the superstitious guy. I'm I'm all about like, hey, maybe we lose in the semifinals. And th- no, I, legitimately though, um, I I actually as superstitious as I am, I want North Carolina to win this ACC championship. Why? Number one, I want to beat Duke again. Number two, I think it's integral for Carolina to get the fourth number one seed. Why? Because if Carolina is a two seed, they're going to be in the East bracket where UConn is going to be the one. I'm just telling you that right now. You need to be aware of that fact. But if North Carolina is is a one seed, they're going to get to go out West, probably have Arizona as the two seed. So just buckle up for that right now. But I I, you know, and I know you can't look ahead. Like you wouldn't face UConn till the Elite Eight, and, the, and there's no way to know if that's going to play out. But I would rather just not. I feel better about playing Arizona than I do UConn. Now I, I know Carolina is infinitely better when they than they were when they faced UConn back in December. But man, that team, that team is something different. The Huskies, man. I'm just telling you. I would rather always face UConn, and of course Caleb's going to go off if it happens. But man, I'd love to see Seth lock him up. Anyway. I want Carolina to win the ACC championship. I really, truly do. And I usually do not say that. I I usually say I want Carolina to to kind of rest and relax, but I want the regular season. I want the conference tournament and I want the NCAA championship. Give me all three of them. I'm here for it. I know you are as well. All right, gang. In a little bit, I'm going to go get ready and record the full show for tomorrow. going to wait till the, the second game is over so we know the opponent so that I can get us set up and ready for that. So uh, be on the lookout for that on Friday morning where we both recap. We'll have our Four Corners recap and then get into preparing for what looks like it's going to be Pittsburgh where we get to once again go up against the Capel brothers, uh, a Dukey and a Tar Heel, but both right now kind of sworn enemies, unfortunately. So we'll do that. See if we can bottle up Blake Henson, who can shoot from the absolute parking lot. All right, gang, you know the drill. If you're not already part of the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community, you're missing out. Come for the Tar Heels, stay for the community. The link is in the show notes. It's free to join. If you're not already part of the Locked on Tar Heels March Madness Bracket Challenge, that link is in the show notes as well. I'd love to have you compete for the glory and the honor of knocking me off. I'm, I overanalyze it all, and I'm not great at it. Also, if you aren't already subscribed, please subscribe on audio and video. If you're on YouTube, you can just hit the little subscribe button. Um, Also, smash the like button so we know you're here. And hit that bell. There's a little bell. If If you hit that for notifications, anytime I go live like this, it'll just pop up a notification for you and you can click right on in. You all know, say it with me, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll talk again tomorrow on the show. I'm not sure if we'll have a live postcast. I'm actually heading up on Friday to the Big 12 tournament um, to cover it for Locked On College Basketball, my national show. Um, I'll try to get something up, but, but no promises on that. So anyway, until Friday for sure, we'll talk then. But for now, peace.